Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP, the Ukraine War Update a news segment for the 29th of March 2023. We go to our usual first port of call, which are the Ukrainian released figures for the Russian losses for the day before, all the usual caveats. You, this may be propaganda and somewhat inaccurate. However, I think these are, are, are more accurate than critics give them credit for, and I think they are very useful for giving us an, uh, a sense, uh, an indication of what has happened the day before. Russia sometimes produce figures, but their figures are so they're just way out. Uh, we talked about that yesterday in one of my videos. Perun's uh, excellent video uh, recently also talks about counting the losses and how uh, the Russian figures are so wildly inaccurate that they are actually physically impossible, uh, what they've claimed to have happened. But anyway, let's talk about these Ukrainian uh, official figures. And what do they tell us? Well, uh, the liquidated personnel, are that number is lower than it has been over the week. Uh, we st we've had a few days around this figure, the down to, to 500s, up to 600 now, but still lower than uh, earlier in in the week or, or last week. We have very few bits of equipment, comparatively speaking. I mean, seven tanks is still significant, but no APCs. Uh, six artillery systems, one MLRS is is useful. That's that's keeping at a fairly consistent level. Uh, but uh, one aircraft, we'll talk about in a second, four drones, five vehicles, one piece of special equipment, five vehicles and fuel tanks, but generally lower figures. So what does this tell us? As an indication, this would suggest to me that it's qu somewhat quieter on across the front lines. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether there's other evidence to support this. And this helps us build up a picture of the war at the moment. Right, talking about losses, this is a loss for the Ukrainians. So they have lost a plane recently because uh, during a combat mission, a Ukrainian pilot, navigator of an aviation squadron, Major Denis uh, Kirilyuk, has died. Uh, the 831, so I think he was the deputy commander or something, um, is a major, I think. Anyway, the 831 Tactical Aviation Brigade uh, that he flew for is obviously, uh, you know, taking a big hit. Uh, any any, any uh, aircraft that's lost is a big hit, but uh, it, it's more about the pilot because these people take a long... I mean, it's a human life first and foremost, and they take an awful long time to train, uh, whereas you can replace planes somewhat more easily i mean that's difficult for the ukrainians obviously at the moment but in general somewhat more easily than you can replace and quickly than you can replace pilots uh, during the performance of combat mission the deputy squadron commander there you go the navigator of the aviation squadron major dennis kirilyuk died the report says um so he uh, uh he will be sorely missed but likewise the same has happened to the russians so overnight around bakhmut a russian su-24 was shot down i think there's uh footage of that possibly someone was saying that the footage is due to come out of that uh, so that's been uh well i say it's been a bad day actually we haven't seen aircraft figures for a good few days from the russians uh, it's quite difficult to get figures from the ukrainians the russians often tell you stuff but again it's it's the credibility of these claims um so uh, if we stick to air activity uh, there was this is the remains of a of a Ukrainian drone uh, painted in national colours found near the railway track in the vicinity of Svetino in Moscow Oblast in Russia. So why I put this up? I mean, Ukraine are sending a lot of drones over into Russia at the moment, but it, it's interesting to see how close these drones are getting to Moscow, and if that is indeed. A Russian drone, uh, sorry, Ukrainian drone, and it's not some kind of intricate psyops operation to make the the Russians in Moscow afraid and build up a kind of uh, a unity of, uh, you know, sense that the Ukrainians are are the bad guys uh, amongst their population. You could see that potentially as a psyops, but it's more likely to be a Ukrainian drone getting very close to Moscow, and that. That is a a cause for concern for the for the Russians for sure because if they can get a drone like that close to to Moscow, what else can they get that close to to Moscow in in terms of aerial threats? Um, in Belgorod, which is again in Russia, just north of the border now, a drone attacked a gas pumping station on the evening of March 27th. Fragments of the explosive device damaged an empty gas tank with a capacity of 30,000 liters, as well as a gas pipeline, said the Russian media buzzer. I have a feeling this hit 
its target, but the target was empty. Well, that's at least what I've read elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, the drone won't have done uh, the damage it was hoping to do, which is you know a big explosion of, of fuel. Uh, most people seem to be talking this morning about Melitopol. So there was uh, a series of explosions in Melitopol. It was loud last night in occupied Melitopol with more explosions. I really believe, says Tim White, that this small city is a big prize for Ukraine and they may be laying the groundwork now. So this is called you know, shaping uh, the battlefield. So we've seen or, or the theatre. Uh, we've seen multiple attacks in recent days. There were reports of sounds like this in three districts. Um, Melitopol is a major transport hub, and if Ukraine can break through the uh, ZSU, should be able to get all the way to the south uh, to end Russia's land bridge to Crimea. Melitopol also has an airfield. This is how it looked at dawn. So the airfield was hit, uh, as well as I believe substations. So Russia government-funded TASS news agency claims, claims citing anonymous sources that around 5:30 the Ukrainian armed forces hit locomotive depot facilities and power infrastructure causing a blackout in occupied Melitopol. So that is airport, rail, and energy infrastructure being hit there. Uh, another one from uh, Tim White just giving an update. Occupiers admit the explosions but say there were no casualties. Electricity went off in several northern suburbs of the city and at the airport soon after the missile hit around 5.30. Consensus of locals is that with 8 to 10 airstrikes so melitopol is definitely here and tim white then adds the act uh, the attack sorry on melitopol has certainly caused panic among russia's elite and military there's so much traffic on the road to and from mariupol especially heavy army trucks that it's uh, been turned into an impassable mud swamp and he provides some footage here of really uh, heavy traffic a lot of um russian military vehicles as well uh and in trying to pass the long streams of traffic, they're causing sort of mud to the side of the road. Hey, so what you might say, but actually it's quite interesting to see this part of the video, which has you know huge amounts of traffic um, in the area. I don't know what that signifies, uh, and most of that traffic seems to be going one way. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, moving on. So, well, actually staying on Melitopol again, more photos are just emerging now of the substation that's here in, in Melitopol. So uh, a variety of targets in that area. Now, going back to the figures I was talking about. So when you see a drop in these kind of figures for liquidated personnel and most of the equipment categories, then you see that the general staff saying the Ukrainian general staff saying the Ukrainian military repels 57 assaults over the past day. So that's 57 assaults up and down the entire front line. That is not a lot. That's a really quiet day. We've had days of sort of 50, 60 at the moment, which I think, again, so what does this tell us? It, it, it feeds into the theory that the Russians have indeed culminated, that they've run out of momentum, they don't have much left in the tank, uh, and that's what you'd expect if this is their period of supposed offensive and they're only committing to, to 57 uh, assaults. So those might be like five troops attacking there. It might be a tank attack over there. It might be this and that. You know, uh, the 57 attacks is not a lot for the whole front line. Um, uh, on the other hand, they are still shelling. Uh, there's a lot of activity in the northern border regions. This is Kharkiv, Regional Ministry of Administration, saying Tverichna, um, Bohodiniv, uh, Vovchansk, uh, Stelecha, Strelecha, and Vetanane and other towns and villages are under Russian attack during the day. Uh, and you can see some of the uh, outcomes of that. So fairly substantial craters being made there. Um, not obviously showing... So when you see these pictures that Ukrainians produce, they often show you residential buildings taken out. They rarely show you when, uh, I presume there are times when these shells are actually hitting military targets, but you don't get to see that because they, obviously they will control that information space. Um, okay, so we have, we're going on to other bits and pieces here. Russian channel uh, Dvar Mayora, two majors, is suggesting that Ukrainians are accumulating heavy 
heavily and preparing to cross the Dnieper. So this is in the Kherson region. They draw this conclusion based on the info about the movement of boats and other equipment, as well as training of crews and improvement of logistics. They only don't know if this will be a main or a distracting strike. Not an offset concern. If a public Russian channel knows it, their command does too. Um, or he could be totally lying. So just to show you on the map what this means, the idea is that they are the Russians are claiming they are seeing activity around the Dnieper River here that suggests that they are getting ready for some kind of counterattack, uh, sorting out the logistics, training, so on and so forth. Uh, the, so the question it has been for, for a long time, where are these counterattacks going to be? I've been saying that, that my... Uh, suggestion or, or my prediction would be to to get this Lambridge down cut maybe around Melitopol maybe around Mariupol maybe maybe two attacks you know in 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 these two places to make a wide land bridge cutting off the uh the logistics to Crimea as well as you know, we already know that the Kerch Bridge's rail logistics there are not working. So that means that this whole area will effectively be cut off from the rail and only serviceable by by road through Crimea. So th this makes this fairly difficult to maintain uh, as far as the Russians are concerned. So I would say that that would be uh, one of the counteroffensives, possibly two. Um, and then your guess is as good as mine. They could strike for Starobilsk. Uh, it could be a counterattack in Bakhmut where they've the Russians have culminated. They aren't thinking defensively and then get hit uh, there. Or if this guy is, or this Russian telegram channel is to be believed, the, the Ukrainians are getting ready for an attack in in across the Dnieper River. So you, it might be that the the Ukrainians are trying some cutting of the land bridge here, whilst also uh, attacking across the Dnipro to to really take back this whole uh, whole area here. I don't know, or it could be uh, a a feint. There there are so many options. The U.S. decision to fly its surveillance drones further south over the Black Sea after a Russian jet collided with the U.S. drone earlier this month quote definitely limits our ability to gather intelligence. A senior U.S. military official tells CNN. So rather than you know, flying in the northern parts of the Black Sea, they're keeping to the southern areas uh, for fear of something similar happening, and that means that they're not getting as much intelligence with each flight. Um, I showed you this video yesterday, a disinformation video of uh, a supposed, supposedly a couple of Ukrainian soldiers stopped her mother and her young child in a car, uh, and then got out and uh, threatened her, spoke to her, you know, called a scum and all this stuff, and then shot at the car and then shot into the air and so on and so forth. And this was all horrible and it showed that the Ukrainians were Nazis. It, it was pretty much convincingly proved to be disinformation, so much so that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Russian uh, official government channel, has taken the video down. Right? After saying, once a Nazi, always a Nazi, and all this kind of stuff, uh, and, and making claims about the video, then they've taken it down because people have, uh, have geolocated the video to well behind the Russian line. So it, it was a Russian vehicle. And then all this kind of stuff that all showed without a shadow of a doubt that this was different disinformation. It's quite interesting seeing the reaction of people who claim they're neutral but really aren't neutral, uh, who are mappers, people like Defence Politics Asia, NWE, uh, War Reports, begrudgingly admitting that this was uh, disinformation, but they didn't. They had, don't seem to have seen Tatragami's uh, analysis, so they only are going on geolocation. And he, Defense Politics Asia says, good job by geolocating. I was thinking it's weird, but good to know that the Russian side are also doing this information campaigns. Uh, so it's now important for everyone. So it's only now important. This is just fascinating. So it's now important for everyone who had been trusting Russian sources to be more careful. <laughs> like a year into this, and it's like it's now important to 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 treat Russian sources skeptically. 
I think for me, this tweet says all you need to know. Like I said, always, everything you see online is because someone wants you to see it. Yeah, that's pretty good advice, uh, but does feel very risky to shoot this video. And he's going on a geolocation, of course, not not looking at any of the other claims uh, that, that show that it's, it's complete disinformation. But I thought that was a really interesting response. Uh, and again, it's always worth concentrating on the little things, what, what people say in the, and the way they say it tells you, you know, represents who they are and how they feel. Okay, so there's been talking about disinformation and misinformation and propaganda. I could do a whole video on what Julia Davis has been putting out in terms of propaganda over the last couple of weeks. There's been some insane stuff, but there always is. But actually, this stuff is incitement to genocide. And actually, these people, if the Nuremberg trials are anything to go by, and if what we saw in Rwanda... Uh, this is identical kind of rhetoric coming from Russian state television. These people will be in The Hague, or they should be in The Hague. So meanwhile in Russia, propagandist Sergei Mardan says that Ukrainians are the undead. It doesn't matter if Russian is a first language for many of them. Ukraine should be erased off the map, and there should be no pity for any Ukrainians. As someone here says, pure Julius uh, Streicher, Nazi propaganda stuff from the 1930s, which led to his conviction as a Nazi war criminal at Nuremberg trials and execution in 1946 for incitement to genocide. Um, and he's basically using uh, you know, really fascist uh, terminology and, and, and verbiage here. Quote, these are simply animals. They don't need to be agitated to lose their human form. They have no human form anymore. Sergei Mardan. So this is dehumanization. This is making humans less than humans so that it gives permission to do anything to them, such as kill them en masse, like you do to vermin, that kind of thing. And this is this is what we saw in the Second World War. This is what we've seen in Rwanda. This is what is happening now with Russia and Ukraine. This is big. Right. So when you start it's stuff like this, I'm getting into rant mode. <laughs> when you when you get pro-Russian voices and appeasers in government, so you can look at the US government and, and see certain appeasers there. You can look at the German government. You can look at, uh, I would say, the British government. Actually, we're pretty unified. It's only people like you know Nigel Farage and a few others who are like skirting around the edge of 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 appeasing Russia, but, but in the main political parties, we're fairly united. But there, in many countries, you will have your appeasers, your Scott Ritters, your Colonel McGregor's, right? You need to answer to this, right? If you are pro-Russia, you need to deal with this kind of a genocidal incitement from the Russian state television, sanctioned, therefore, by the Russian state. If that isn't taken off air, stuff like this, and stuff that I've talked about before, right? If that isn't taken off air, then that is that is implicit or even explicit sanctioning of those words, right? Which is state-sanctioned uh, incitement to genocide. How do you deal with that pro-Russian? How do you deal with that Russian appeaser? It's not good enough to appease people like this. People like this need to be confronted and stopped. And the only way you stop them in this context is to win the war in Ukraine. So the only way to stop genocide is to provide Ukraine with everything they need to win the war in their own country. End of rant. Okay, going on to military aid uh, and other such things. Slovakia plans to increase the production of 1.5 mil shells by five times, from 30,000 to 150,000 pieces a year, Defence Minister of Slovakia. Now, this is very, very small fry. In reality, 150,000 is, what, 500 bits of ammunition a, a day, less than 500 a day, really. Uh, so... It's, it's not a huge amount, but it's exactly what uh, Ukraine need because they apps they are screaming for ammunition uh, uh, yeah, shells uh, sorry for artillery ammunition and no no one country can provide all of that so it's got to be a case of everyone uh, you know, really pooling their resources and working together collaborating to get the ammunition to Ukraine. As we see below, Denmark will build a new ammunition factory. Unfortunately, that will not help the here and now, but 
yeah, it, it needs to get there. So France, so here we, we're talking about 2,000 uh, per month. So France, the double number of 155 mil ammunition shells delivered to Ukraine, bringing it up to 2,000 per month. So at the moment, they're getting 1,000 a month to Ukraine. Now, remember, Ukraine are presently using maybe somewhere between three and 5,000 a day. And they need the Russia are probably somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand a day, and they're having shell hunger, so they should be somewhere. They have been previously somewhere around forty to sixty thousand a day. So France is brilliant from France, but two thousand per month, that really needs to be, you know, two thousand per day type thing. So uh, as per Stoltenberg, Ukraine uses four to 7,000 shells per day against Russia's 20,000. Ukraine's allies seek ways to increase ammunition supply. So that's brilliant from those countries. And I, I, it was quite interesting. I was listening to Dom Nichols on Ukraine, the latest podcast yesterday, which is a Telegraph podcast. Uh, and he's really great, uh, Dom Nichols. However, I was a little bit disappointed in a lack of criticism. So he was like, he was saying what I've just said saying, oh, you know, France really need to do more type thing. To This is just a drop in it. This is great, but, you know, it needs to be a lot more than that. Without saying, yeah, but also what are Britain doing? Like, I, I've not heard anything about the UK. So it's one thing to to say everyone else should, should up, up their, you know, quantity of ammunition that they're sending to Ukraine. But I last I heard is that BAE systems hadn't received any contract from the UK government to... to sanction building manufacturing way more ammunition so yes we we should be calling on as as british people i'm speaking as a brit here we should be calling on our other nations to up their game and provide ammunition to ukraine but do you know what what are we doing i don't know maybe we're doing a brilliant job it's not being advertised but as i say it appears that the bae systems are not ramping up production and and really they should be uh France again, so, hey, les Français, excellent, très bien, très bien fait. Uh, AMX 10 here, I, I have seen only limited footage, a little bit of training footage of, the, of these. It's, it's, it, I assume this is in Ukraine, uh, and you've got a couple of American vehicles behind as well, I believe, sort of MRAPs or military vehicles of some sort. Uh, so that that's really good news. Uh, it's all starting to ramp up and getting towards the counter-offensive. British Army Challenger 2 tanks came with a corresponding ARV, Armoured Recovery Vehicle. That's really good. Waiting to see if also the Trojan AVRE Armoured Engineering Vehicles were delivered. So the British uh, are coming up with the goods to some degree there. They are going to need lots of these sorts of vehicles. So one, that's great. Um, but uh, again, it's a case of more, more, more. Uh, Switzerland plans to adopt a motion to retire 25. Is that Panzer? Uh, Panzer 87. So those are actually Leopard 2A4s. Those are versions of Leopards that are not the most recent, but they're still Leopard 2s, and prepare them for a potential sale to Germany. Germany has asked to buy 96 of these in storage and intends to use them to backfill the fleet of those uh, sending Leopard 2 to Ukraine. Now, I presume they can do this because this is these were these are German manufactured tanks that have been sold to the Swiss and then they're buying them back so Germany can decide what to do with these. Uh, that would be amazing if they could provide 96 Panzer twos, uh, and they're still pretty decent. Germany wants to buy them to give them to Ukraine. The A4 version is old. Germany uses only versions from A6 and above, so A6 and A7. A5 is only used in the aggressor role in combat training centers, So, but still will be uh, you know, quite a tricky um, you know, opponent, the Leopard 2A4 for the Russians. So it'll be, it'll be you know, comparatively better than the kit that the Russians are throwing against them the ukrainians the canadian budget 2023 provides ukraine with an additional loan of 2.4 billion dollars for 2023 uh, which will be provided via the imf administered account for ukraine so that's really good they obviously need money to continue operating as a country just doing what countries do you got pensions you got education you got welfare uh, you got the health service and that's particularly difficult when you you will have had your economy absolutely mullered by a war 
uh, and tax intake will be down, so on and so forth. Really important. Obviously, you know, there's going to be international inward investment is going to be hit as well. So they, they need they need money. Uh, Russia braces for uh, an attack by 50,000 Ukrainian kamikaze drone uh, and they seek shotguns. Um, so Ukraine are preparing, this is for a Forbes article, are preparing a drone offensive. And in January, General Ukrainian General Command announced the formation of new tactical drone assault units. I mentioned this the other day. Uh, I wonder, I mean, goodness, imagine you... This could, this really could be happening because I, I talk about if you just flooded Bakhmut with you know five hundred snipers, you know these ideas of just get loads of this stuff so they just can't cope with it. You know they they wouldn't be able to move a block in in Bakhmut for for fear of being hit by snipers. In the same way, like I'll, I'll just train up a few drones and have a few first person view drones, yeah, hitting the odd tank here with a warhead. 50,000 of these flying around, bosh, bosh, bosh. I'm, I'm probably being just completely impractical. But the idea is if, if, if you create these entire, you know, battalions of, of drones and drone uh, operators, you, you, could, you could do some serious damage. Imagine the fear you would, you would put in, in the Russians if they saw swarms or, or just l large numbers of these drones because swarm... You know, it talks about like working together, uh, you know, and it, it's possibly the, the wrong word, but but you know, if you saw these masses of drones coming over, you know, it'd just be incredibly um, frightening. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll probably dip into that article later. Uh, going on to geopolitics, the IOC president talked about this yesterday. He was going to have a little wonder about whether the Russians and Belarusians are going to be allowed to compete in the Olympic Games, uh, probably under a neutral flag. Now, he this is a chap who, as Tim White says, has often been seen shaking Putin's hand, uh, said that Russian and Belarus as athletes can compete in the Olympics. Spineless, says uh, Tim White. Many Russian Olympians are in the army killing Ukrainians. The word compromat is in my head for some reason. Um, so... Uh, there you go. He, uh, that went, I guess, as was expected. It is disappointing. Now, Zelensky has had a um, an interview with, I think this is, is AP, Associated Press. Yes. Uh, if Bakhmut falls before Russian troops, uh, Putin will, quote, sell his victory to the West, his society, China, Iran, in order to gain international support and force Ukraine to make unacceptable compromises, says Zelensky. The president of Ukraine gave an interview to AP agency during his trip from Sumy uh, to Kiev, explained the significance of Bakhmut, which the Ukrainian military continues to defend. There's been lots of criticism about Zelensky and, and the Ukrainian army saying that this is a political decision rather than a tactical or military decision operational decision and i mean it could be both however pe people kind of dismiss political decisions as being you know less less important or or are really cynical about them and the problem is you are sacrificing human lives for a political decision but the political decision can have just as important ramifications as a military decision in terms of whether you know, Russia are going to continue committing to, to a war or, or, or this and that. So if Russia make a, a political failure here, then it can make their own decision makers reticent to continue or it can get the Russian public um, a bit angsty and so on and so forth. If, if Russia get a political win out of this, they can maybe get Chinese and Iranian uh, donations in terms of... of military equipment that then end up you know causing deaths themselves and so we shouldn't dismiss political decision making within the military sphere it has a has a place and and it's arguably politically very important that ukraine maintain the defense of bakhmut for military reasons down down the line so it might not seem like a prima facie military decision but it's a political decision that has military ramifications. Now, I'm, I'm not defending the decision to maintain the Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the information. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't dismiss the political decisions 
you know, out of hand just because they are political decisions, not military or or operational decisions. Uh, but it's interesting uh, to hear him say that. So Zelensky himself has invited Xi Jinping to Ukraine, writes CAP. We are ready to see him here. I want to talk to him. I was in contact with him before the full scale war. But for this whole year, more than a year, we have had no contact. That would, of course, be a super important meeting. Anyway, that's the end of the news today. Hope that was in, in some way useful and interesting. Please like, subscribe and share. Really appreciate all of your um, support for the channel. Uh, my brain is a bit frazzled today, uh, so apologies if I've been a bit uh, stuttery and whatnot. Anyway, I will speak to you later in the Frontline Update. Take care. Toodle pips.